Well, good afternoon. We are Shoreline Capital. My name is Jared Bernard Goldstein. James Bohan. John Pennell. Colin Uber. Riley Lewis. Hunter Belmont. And we are the portfolio managers for the J.P. Morgan Strategic Property Fund. We're an open-ended core real estate fund founded in 1986. We target returns between 7.5 and 8% with low 30% leverage. We're on the lower end of the risk return spectrum. To us, that means we are willing to sacrifice a reasonable level of return in order to minimize the risk for our investors. We target assets in primary markets, with stable tenants, and stable long-term cash flows. The site we'll be discussing with you today is the Landmark Center site in Boston, Massachusetts. It contains two important elements. The first is an approximately 700,000 Class A office building. The largest tenant, Blue Cross Blue Shield, occupies over 50% of the gross leasable area and has a lease that is expiring in May of 2015. Next to our office building is a surface parking lot primed for development. We have two potential options on this site. The first, the residential option, is 605 luxury residential units over two residential towers. The second is a retail option, two stories and approximately 200,000 square feet of retail. When considering these two options, we had to look at our allocation in relation to our benchmark. Since we are a core real estate fund, we are benchmarked against the Naycreek Real Estate Index. We are diversified on both an asset type and geographic diversification. In terms of retail and residential, we're relatively in line with the allocations in our benchmark. Boston is our fourth largest geographic location for capital, and it already comprises 8% of our national residential investment. In this particular submarket, Boston Fenway, already comprises 3% of our national allocation for residential. Now we have one project underway, but we currently have no retail exposure in the Boston market. We chose the retail development option, and today we're going to cover five major reasons why we went in that direction. The first, the retail development offers the best risk-adjusted returns. Second, the retail development is most in line with our core fund strategy. Third, significant synergies exist between our existing assets in the market and this proposed development. Fourth, we will be able to negotiate favorable partnership terms with an experienced and familiar sponsor. And finally, the current market dynamics support immediate development. I'm now going to talk about some of the market dynamics in Boston and why we feel it's such an attractive location for both development and continued investment. First, Boston has an incredibly strong employment market and ranks among the first in the Northeast. Nationally, it is above averages for both job growth and the employment rate. Second, Boston benefits from the urbanization trend that is happening across America, and I'll get into that in the next slide. Third, Boston is a gateway city and is very attractive for foreign direct investment. This will help preserve asset values as capital flows into this market and give us a potential exit at disposition. When we look into the two sub-product markets, residential and retail, they're both very strong as well. The multifamily market currently has 200,000 units. 10% of this product is going to be added in the next five years. Vacancy is below 4%. And rent growth has been over 3.5% for the past two years, with a projection of 2.7% for the next five. Like I said, retail is just as strong and has been traditionally understored. This has caused a low vacancy for the retail in Boston as well, and it is below 4% too. And as there is constrained supply, this will increase demand for our asset and the other retail assets. When we look into the urbanization trend, the millennial generation is really driving this and these are going to be the users of our site. First, millennials are delaying marriage. As they delay marriage, they are starting families later and later in life. These delayed family starts are reducing demand for suburban resources and increasing demand for urban living as they stay in city centers longer and move there more and more. One of the hottest trends in real estate capital markets these days is Chinese foreign direct investment. When these investors are looking to place capital in markets in the United States, they look for two major criteria. The first being locations with strong colleges and universities, and second, direct flights to and from China. 
Boston has over 100 colleges and universities within its MSA, and two of this country's most prestigious and internationally known schools, Harvard and MIT, are located very close to our property. Now let's take a look at the Fenway submarket itself. Fenway is emerging as one of the preeminent examples of the live, work, play environment the millennial generation is demanding. It's a transit-oriented zone with the T and other public transportation delivering people there 24 hours a day. In addition, it has become an active development zone as developers have keyed in on this live, work, play aspect and are going there to make this happen. Third, Fenway is also a great employment center. Over 70,000 work workers come there every day. In addition to this, there are over 3 million visitors a year to Fenway Park between its 81 ball games and various concerts and events held there. So I'm going to be discussing our first option, the residential development of Landmark Towers. Upon completion, Landmark Towers will feature 538 market rate units and 77 affordable units and a mini rich building that's architecturally distinctive in order to appeal to the affluent demographic that we're targeting. In order to conduct this analysis, we took a look at our existing comps and immediately realized that we already own more than 600 units in the direct competitive set. Amongst our competition, run, rents are very high, from $4.25 on the low end to about $5.50 on the high end per month. Despite these high rents, vacancy are, is very low, above 70, 97% for all stabilized properties, with an average vacancy of only 2%. Because of this dynamic, high rents and low vacancy, the fundamentals support new development, and there is a lot of development occurring. Currently, there are four projects under construction set to deliver before the end of 2015. We actually own one of these projects, the 72-unit Van Ness project, which will be delivered in the first quarter of 2015. When considering this, we not only considered the market, we also had to evaluate our capital structure. We have two basic choices for our debt, a traditional bank loan and a life insurance loan. Although the bank loan offered attractive, low-floating interest rate, it didn't properly align with our stabilization period. Alternatively, the life insurance loan offers an interest-only loan at an attractive rate of 5.19% and properly aligns with our whole strategy. We're currently in negotiations with Samuels, our partner. We worked with Samuels in the past, and when we've done so, SPF contributed 97% of the equity, with Samuels contributing the balance. We're also renegotiating the waterfall structure to better align the equities. We're pushing for a 10% tier one prep with a split of 85-15 thereafter. Behind me now, you can see an overview of the residential investment matrix. There's a lot on this slide, so I'm only gonna to touch on a few key items. First, this is a large project, more than 300 million in development costs. And upon stabilization, when combined with our existing office asset, will be worth more than $800 million. Despite this large level investment, it would provide reasonable returns over the 10-year hold period of approximately 10% per year. This assumes a 5% exit cap and 2.5% annual rent growth. As you can see by the charts at the bottom of this table, our returns are highly variable on these two factors, especially the exit cap rate. So essentially what I've been discussing are the risk and mitigants for the residential option. First, we have a large development pipeline. Because of this large development pipeline, we need to ensure that if we move forward with this option, that it's distinct in the market. Second, SPF already has a very large portfolio in Boston, and it's growing, although we do continue to like our assets there, and Boston in general is a core market. Third, we have the very real risk of exit cap expansion. Because of our low land bases, we are able to mitigate this risk as well as our long-term hold strategy. There are, however, two risks that are going to be very difficult for us to mitigate. These are the fact that our project is going to be a large construction site that's going to be highly disruptive to our existing office tenant, and the project is going to take 30 months to be complete. Last, we have the very real possibility that we're actually going to deliver this residential development into a down cycle, leading to slower absorption and reduced rents. So this brings us to retail. I'm excited to introduce to you Landmark Square, which is our proposed use for the site. Landmark Square will feature 193,000 square feet of retail, divided between an anchor, junior anchor, and shop space. It will be situated directly adjacent to our existing office building and be integrated via a pedestrian plaza. 
Development is expected to take 24 months to substantial completion and an additional 12 months to stabilization. Our operating partner, Samuels, is currently in advanced negotiations with the premier grocer, Wegmans, serves our anchor tenant and occupies 63,000 feet when nearly a third of our space. Uh, projected rents for the complex range from $35 to $60 per foot per year with the first floor shop space managing upgraded. Wegmans will be an excellent anchor tenant. In addition to grocers having a history of serving as successful anchors, Wegmans is particularly attractive because it's a high-end store that will cater to an affluent Fenway customer base and because of its wide offerings of prepared foods, which are attractive um, among busy millennials who are constantly on the go. In addition, Wegmans has uh, demonstrated unparalleled loyalty in its markets and was recently ranked the number one grocer in the country by Consumer Reports. The construction debt options offered for the retail development are similar to those offered for the residential. And again, for many of the same reasons, we prefer the long-term fixed rate debt offered by the life company. Here's a recap of the equity terms that we're currently negotiating with, negotiating with the annuals. We're primarily working on three main points with them. Number one, maintaining their interest in both the existing office asset and the retail, retail development at 3%. Two, increasing their liability for cost overruns up to twice the amount of their development fee versus once. And three, increasing the returns in favor of the fund, such that distributions are pro rata up to 10% IRR and 85-15 thereafter. These are the financials for the retail development. The total development budget is 114 million. This includes an increased allowance for TIs, which we believe may be necessary to attract the high-end tenants that we're targeting. Um, looking over at the returns, you see their superior by all key metrics with an IRR of 13%, equity multiple of 2.8 times, and average cash on cash over the whole period of 11%. Here's a recap Any ground up development will carry its risks, and I'd like to talk to you now about some of the risks of this retail option. First off, as you all know, as customers have moved online, there's been a decline in traditional retail. Malls have emptied out and a lot of big brands have gone out of business. But at the same time that's happened, there's been another trend taking place. And that has been that millennials, and in fact people at every age, have become more discerning consumers. When they go out shopping, they demand unique experiences. They want novel establishments and local tastes, and they want authentic restaurants giving them a special experience. We believe that if we can bring them these sorts of things at Landmark Square, we can turn it into this sort of special third place that people today so crave, in between home and work, where they can get a good social experience. The second risk we'd like to talk about is the threat from competing retail centers. Although that is a very real risk that we have to consider, at the time this area is under retail. Even if other centers were to come online, which we don't foresee at this moment, we believe that the local population is affluent enough and the traffic volumes going to Fenway are enough that they can keep the center profitable. Finally, with construction so hot right now, there's a very real risk of construction cost overruns and of construction delays. While that's difficult to mitigate, we have submitted a counterproposal to Samuels, our sponsor, in which we've asked them to assume all responsibility for construction overruns up to two times their development fee, and this is after using up the contingency. We believe that this will cover most plausible scenarios. Now I'd like to walk you through why we think that the retail center is the best use for this site. There are a few reasons for this. So first off, if you look at where this fund is today, and you look at our investors and their risk profiles, we believe that this retail center, for the reasons that we gave, it, we believe that this is the best use of the site. Second, if you look at where the real estate market is today in the cycle, Multifamily is hot, prices are high, and we don't know how much room is left in the multifamily market for asset appreciation and rent growth. Next, we believe that this site can create really great synergies. We have a lot of assets nearby, and we believe that if we do this right, this can drive off the value of our other existing assets. And finally, if you look at this site's location near Fenway, we do agree that it really would have been a great spot for some Class A luxury residential, but it was an extraordinary spot for retail. And it would have been a mistake to let that sort of a once in a generation opportunity get passed up. So in addition to the traditional metrics that we use to evaluate this site, 
like basis point spread. We also used a different metric that's more commonly used in financial valuation. And that metric was Tobin's key ratio. When applied to real estate, Tobin's key ratio comes out to yield on cost divided by market cap rate. Tobin's key ratio tells us two things in real estate. First, how large will that project's financial margin of safety be upon completion? Second, how likely is it that new competition will come through the pipeline to, complete, to compete with us? If you take a look at the graph, that vertical red line indicates a Tobin ratio of one. Projects where the yield on cost is equal to the cap rate. Projects to the left of that are underwater and would only be developed by speculators or by developers working for a fee. Projects to the right of that, like ours, have a high likelihood of being successful. And the further we go, the more likely the probability that they'll be successful. Due to our low land basis and other things, our site has a high Tobin skew ratio of 1.25, indicating a very high likelihood for success. Thank you, Riley. We got like to tie it all back in with five key points of our investment rationale. Number one, the retail development option offers superior risk-adjusted returns. If you compare the summary financial output to the residential and retail developments, you'll see the retail is superior in nearly every metric. We have a higher level of IRR, return on cost, stabilized cash on cash return, and equity multiple. Number two, the retail development option best aligns with our SPF core fund strategy. It's important to remember that we're making this decision not just at the property level, but at the fund level. The JP Morgan Core Real Estate Fund, the largest commingled real estate fund in the world, has outperformed across, across various economic cycles because it is stuck to its core mandate and has avoided strategy shift. We believe any additional allocation of residential within Boston could be viewed as an overweight, overweight allocation and thus a strategy shift. Furthermore, adding luxury retail to that already residential weighted um, geographic portfolio within Boston will help diversify that portfolio in the market. And finally, even pursuing this, this development immediately will allow us to maintain a number well underneath the 5% maximum NAV allocated to development and 30% leverage maximum on the Number three, we believe there are key synergies that we can create between our existing Class A office and the proposed luxury retail. For example, it's important to remember that we have an existing 700,000 square foot Class A office building that's owned by our fund and it's about to go 54% vacant with no sign of a tenant in sight in six months. Now, imagine for a second that you're a large corporation looking to take space in our submarket. If you hear, you're looking at our property, and you hear we're about to spend four years building two high-rise towers right next to all your clients and customers, you might not be that excited about taking our space and may look elsewhere. On the other hand, if you hear that we're going to take less time to deliver a luxury retail amenity that directly caters to all your customers and employees, and it's anchored by Wegmans Grocer, one of the most popular in the country, I think you're more likely to take that space. That's going to ensure that our office property is going to maintain profitability and we establish a symbiotic relationship between the existing Class A office and the luxury retail. Fourth, we still think it's key and necessary to better negotiate our terms with our operating partner Samuels. We want to make sure, make sure that they maintain skin of the game with at least 3% of the capital contributions for this deal. And by modifying the waterfall structure, we want to make sure that we're more adequately compensated as a fund for the amount of risk we're taking as the vast majority of equity in this deal. And finally, we believe the current market dynamics support immediately moving forward with the retail development option. There is a burgeoning affluent resident population that is demanding experiential, high quality, unique retail. And that is exactly what we're delivering with this project. As well, at the fund level, we have a large investor queue, 7% of net asset value. We have capital to deploy, and we believe this is an intelligent deployment of that capital. And once again, Bringing a premier anchor tenant like Wegmans in will ensure that we establish that symbiotic relationship between Class A office and luxury retail for years to come. Overall, we hope that we've proven the retail development option offers superior risk-adjusted returns and investment is in line with our core fund mandate. We thank you for your time, and now I'd like to open up to any questions. I got a question. Yeah. So, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the response. If I put myself in the position that I'm at Samuels with the proposal that you've laid out, where the initiating partner in the buyout is responsible for loan prepayment penalties. If I'm a one and a half percent partner in a 
think you guys are in control of major decisions, including how it's financed. <clears throat> and you want to put fixed rate, long term debt. We achieved the development pro forma of stabilize the project in three years. <clears throat> I'd like to get monetized. Given the size of the loan, the amount of the defeasance associated with prepayment at that time could completely wipe out my entire investment. How would you respond to that being on the other side of J.P. Morgan? Absolutely. So in the event a situation like this were to occur, SPF has the resources available to make that purchase directly. The way our arrangement with Samuels is structured, in the event one of the parties is looking to exit the transaction, the alternative party has the first right of refusal to purchase the prop their interest in the property. So in this case, since Samuel's interest is 3%, our fund has the resources to make that acquisition. So you wouldn't apply, if you were just buying them out, you wouldn't apply that penalty to the buyer? Correct. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be applicable. Yeah. So it's only if you were selling to a third party. Right, and we had to, had to pay off the debt, correct. You said uh, for right or it's actually a right or right? Or are you actually looking to change that in terms of the it would, you are correct, it would be. I'm interested that you, you select the retail, but you did not really talk about the detail mix and what kind of tenants you might be doing. Is there, is there a concept that you're thinking about, or is, uh, is it still open? Yes, while the leasing is up to the sponsor, we did look at some potential tenants. We really want to activate the experiential nature of the, of the retail. So some of the core anchors in addition to Wegmans we looked at would be something like an Apple store. If there are too many Apple stores in the area, we're also looking at Google and Samsung. We're also looking to um, start doing competing uh, technology centers. We also want to bring in the Dave & Busters as they are a great experiential retail place to go and a very good candidate for some second floor retail. We also want to bring in some restaurant and eatery amenities. So we look at places like Fido's Irish Pub, one of the top rated Irish pubs in the nation and places like Dunkin' Donuts and Sprinkle uh, Cupcakes, which is a very boutique uh, cupcakery and will help serve the millennial generation. In addition, we'd like to bring in some boutique fitness operators, such as Yoga Works or Fitwall, in order to really cater to those millennials who really don't have time between work and going home, and this would be an addition to the third place where they can stop and get their fitness taken care of. I was wondering how you would respond to maybe as if I was part of the investment committee in JP Morgan and reminded you that JP Morgan SPF is really a very long term, core oriented, low volatility fund. How do you square putting in something that uh, is a grocer that has an unproven, this is an unproven footprint for them, uh, all of their activity before that has been suburban? And they're they're going to try a concept to shrink by half their current formula. You've also got second floor retail, which historically has been extremely difficult. You probably have a high turnover. How do you square that with the concept that, that it sounds to me like you're using the office um, tenants and the office and the existence of the current of the office <coughs> to drive your rationale for bringing in retail, at where as opposed to Residential could stand on its own. Uh, it'd be probably a little more consistent versus retail. I think it's a great question. What we really looked at is the fact that every one of these investments we think needs to stand on its own merits. So our opinion is an overweight allocation in Boston would be adding that other retail, that residential project. It's 600 units. That would put our total um, countrywide allocation to residential at 10% just in Boston and a significant portion in that sub-market. So for, that, for us, that was that decision on residential. As far as the retail, we know that there are several other grocers that have been successful with that smaller footprint. Whole Foods is a great example. They operate footprints of similar sizes and are widely pop wildly popular, I think one of the most popular in the country. And we've seen templates and other projects um, where second floor retail has been successful with amenities that are catered toward experience. Things like Alamo Draft House, if you know that. So there are a few things to consider that we're renegotiating with Samuels. The first is their upfront equity contribution. We have some flexibility in that structuring. 
Right now, they're our partner in both the office building and they would be in this project as well. They're looking to reduce their equity stake in the office building down from 3% to 1.5%. We would feel comfortable allowing them to do that if they did, in fact, maintain their interest in this new transaction at 3%. If for liquidity reasons they're unable to do that, SPF would be comfortable contributing additional equity with repayment coming out of cash flows that otherwise would have gone to Samuels on the back end. If we were unable to negotiate a more favorable waterfall for us, we're not sure that the risk we're taking developing a new ground up asset would be consumerant with uh, our returns. Along the same lines, what, uh, what about the doubling of the construction cost overrun? They decided if your quality tenured operating partner said, I'm not doing that, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, going to do a deal unless you let me sell and, and liquidate the office. I'm afraid you're going to run off a tenured quality operating partner. Right, and that, that's a great point. That's something that we talked about quite a bit. As it pertains to doubling the developer fee as a requirement to cover cost overruns, this is really a point that we inserted in our negotiations to use to leverage in other areas. So this is something that would mitigate their concern. Well, it wouldn't really mitigate their concern. However, it would uh, give them a strong reason to ensure that costs are managed appropriately. And alternatively, if they weren't comfortable with doubling the amount of their guarantee, we would possibly be able to renegotiate a different waterfall. Yes? Would the investment committee, uh, will they have a deal right after this one? We have to decide today if we're going to move forward with the proposal. Uh, are you going to make your proposal continue on signing the web based deal, or do you recommend doing that with those spec based deals? So we do believe that a huge part of the steel's value comes from, Weg comes from Wegmans. And we do believe that while they give great value to our deal, we're bringing great value to them as well because we're allowing them to try out their new urban store format in a place where we think it could work well. I would say that it becomes more challenging if Wegmans does not sign. We believe that they will because at this point we're in the advanced LOI stage. If they do not sign an LOI, we would certainly be open to talking to other similar reta retailers. And we firmly believe that in a Class A location like that, with the foot traffic that it gets, we would be able to fill that spot with somebody who would fill that niche very, very well. So you're asking for approval on spec bill inspection. But we, uh, we would do it contingent on having an anchor tenant as Wegmans or similar to Wegmans so we wouldn't proceed. We find it very unlikely that Wegmans won't move forward. And if they don't, because of the location, because of the foot tra traffic, we think we're going to get someone very, very similar. If that doesn't happen to be the case. So, there is a lot of detail on the tech floor detail, a lot of detail, and you want to have experience in detail. So, which every other landlord in every urban area is also going to get. So, one, how do you think Samuels as a leasing agent going to attract those people? And two, did you change any of your assumptions? Uh, when you have to pay and warming up the building and, uh, Sure. So Samuels, um, we've worked with them you know, a number of times in the past, and they have demonstrated a strong track record. So as far as handling the leasing uh, you know, um, requirements in retail, as far as handling the leasing requirements, we are very confident in them. Um, we did increase our allowance for TIs for both the second floor shop space and for the junior anchor space, up from 50 to 60 for the junior anchor, and then 50 to 65 to attract the second floor tenants. And in addition to Colin's point, it's important to note that because our returns on this deal are so high, we'd actually be able to operate above break even with significantly less vacancy, around 50%. <laughs> Absolutely. So Samuels is going to be contributing. What I was referring to earlier is they want to cash out on both the office deal as well as this new retail development. So we would be looking to maintain their 3% interest in the retail stake. Uh, they would be earning a 3% development fee. And that's one of the opportunities for us to 
kind of claw back some of their cash flow in the event they're unable to do that. But it's also important to note that not every deal Samuel does is with SPF. They're working on other projects in the area, and we want to ensure that they're not taking this capital and putting it in other projects that would compete directly with us. Unless we're comfortable, unless we believe that their financials on their own merit do not warrant that investment, and then we have the opportunity to possibly claw back other from other areas. However, we are very firm on this point. It's our, it's our number one priority, but if, it, if we can't meet that, there are other areas we're gonna look at to modify to become more favorable to us, if that's the option of last resort. That's, that's all we have time for questions.